Okay, let's look at the last part of chapter five for today. Uh, we're going to start by talking about different types of aqueous solutions and how solutions in general dissolve. We have two different types of solutions. Okay, we have one solution that we can consider um, solutions of ionic compounds and the other ones that are molecular compounds. You have to remember the difference between ionic and molecular compounds to really help you uh, focus in on what's happening here. Um, if you think about salt water and sugar water, both of those solutions have components dissolved in the water. In a salt solution though, you have something like NaCl, which is an ionic compound, right? It's made up of a metal and a nonmetal. Whereas in sugar water, you have some type of sugar dissolved in the water. And any type of sugar molecule, even if you look here at the formula C12H22O11, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are all nonmetals. So this is a molecular compound. So we have an ionic compound here and a molecular compound here, and they're both dissolved in water, okay? But there is a difference in the way that they dissolve. When you're looking at the dissolution of particles, you're, you're looking at two main interactions that are happening, all right? You've got these interactions between the solute particles themselves. And remember, one definition of solute is the material that's going to change state when something dissolves. So we're talking about the sugar and the salt themselves here. Those solute particles have some kind of attractive force between each other, okay? There's also an attractive force between the solvent, which is the water in this case, and the solute, all right? So when these two things start to mix around, there's going to be an attraction between the solvent and the solute particles one that's going to be pulling the solute particles towards the solvent and vice versa. But there's also going to be the solute-solute interactions that are still happening. Okay, and those are going to hold the solute together because they're being attracted to one another. Um, when the solute-solvent interaction is strong enough, when it's stronger than the solute-solute interaction, the solute starts to pull apart. Okay, um, if we look at the charge distribution in a water molecule, that's going to help us see how that pulling apart happens. Okay, uh, if you remember from, <clears throat> excuse me, if you remember from like your biology classes, and even a little about what we talked about earlier in the semester, um, this is, it's like a space filling model of a water molecule. Uh, this larger middle portion here, that's your oxygen. And each of these smaller blue portions or bluish portions are your hydrogen. And you'll notice these little symbols, okay? That's telling you here that the oxygen has a partial negative charge on it. And each of the hydrogens has a partial positive charge on it. Right? And that's because the oxygen is so much more electronegative than the hydrogen. So it's gonna sort of pull all of the electrons in that molecule towards itself, all right? So it gets more of a negative charge um, and then it leaves the, leaves the hydrogens with more of a positive charge. Um, what happens though then is if you have something like sodium chloride, well, in sodium chloride, sodium, right? It's a, it's a cation and chlorine, chloride is an anion. So the negative charge on this water molecule and the positive charge on the sodium, there's a strong attraction between the two of those, right? The positive charge from these hydrogens and the negative charge on this chloride ion, that has a really good attraction. So the attraction of the solute and the solvent overcomes the attraction of the sodium and the chlorine to each other, and they get pulled apart. 
okay? Then what happens is the sodium ion sort of gets surrounded in solution, all right? So it gets surrounded because all of the oxygen portions of the water molecules kind of get attached, not attached like with a bond, but attached like a little magnet, right? They sort of, they sort of end up surrounding that, that sodium ion. And all the hydrogens, the hydrogen ends of the water molecules end up surrounding that chloride ion. And that keeps it insulated from other ions, right? So it's not going to reform this solid sodium chloride because now they're insulated ions in solution. They're not going to react to anything else. What happens once these ions become insulated by the water molecules is that they are able to conduct electricity through the solution because now they're just operating like free ions, free charged particles. And when you have free charged particles in a solution, you can conduct electricity through that solution. Okay? Um, a solution like that, where you have a, a bunch of free char charged particles moving in solution is uh, an electrolyte solution, okay? And we call something an electrolyte if when it dissolves in water, it can conduct electricity. So things like salts or ionic compounds that dissolve in water, those are electrolyte. Anything that dissolves and forms ions is an electrolyte. All right, now something like sugar, we haven't looked at that molecule yet, but we hopefully remember that molecular compounds, they do not come apart in solution, okay? So a sugar molecule is going to stay whole as it dissolves in water, it dissolves by a slightly different mechanism. So it's not going to form ions in solution because it does not form ions in solution it will not conduct electricity. So sugar is an example of a non-electrolyte. And with the exception of like acids and bases, your molecular compounds in general are non-electrolytes. Okay, so we have examples here of electrolyte solutions. Um, things like sodium chloride that completely dissociate into ions, right? Um, things like acid, and bases, even though they are molecular compounds, if you remember uh, what we talked about before, acids and bases form ions in solution, right? They form hydrogen ions and the counter conjugate base. They form hydroxide ions and the conjugate acid. So the fact that they are forming ions means that they are electrolytes. Things like sugar, those are molecular compounds. Those will stay whole. And this is a good example of what we're looking at in a molecular solution. So in a molecular solution, um, you see this congregation of water molecules around you know, a central object. That is how your water molecules end up dissolving something like sugar, okay? They don't pull the molecule apart but they separate the molecule from other molecules of the same material. They separate, so you can imagine that all these four clusters here, that at one point they were all making up um, a sh like sugar, okay? Like the solid sugar you'd see in like your, your spoon if you're putting it in your coffee. Um, then the water comes in and it's separating the, the sugar molecules from one another. It's separating and surrounding them, okay? And as soon as the water molecules surround a molecule of sugar, then it stays dissolved in water. It does not form a solid again, which is different from what's happening over here when the ions, when, when you separate out an ionic compound, you're separating things out into their specific ions, right? Um, one type of molecular compound that does form ions, like we were just saying, uh, are acids, okay? 
the water molecules are going to pull apart the hydrogen ions and whatever the anion is that's attached to the hydrogen ion. And that will leave you with a solution that has ions in it and a solution that will be able to conduct electricity to some degree. What's different with acids is that this, this sentence right here, the percentage of molecules that ionize varies from one acid to another. So when you have an ionic compound that dissolves in water, you can be sure that if it's a soluble compound, it's all going to dissolve in water. When you have an acid, if you have a, if you don't have, you don't necessarily have rather 100% dissolution, okay? You might have 25%, you might have 10%. Um, you don't have 100% all the time, okay? But acids that do ionize 100%, any acid that completely ionizes in solution, we call those acids strong acids. Okay, and you'll hear that term a lot. Is it a strong acid or is it a weak acid? We're not talking about whether it's a dangerous acid or not when we say that. We're talking about whether or not it will dissolve or whether or not it will ionize 100% in solution. Okay, so something that ionizes 100% in solution is a strong acid. Uh, there are many, many, many other acids that do not ionize 100% and we call those weak acids. Okay, so they're going to be less than 100%. So we have two examples here. Uh, you have hydrochloric acid. 100% of the hydrochloric acid dissolves into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. And you'll notice the single forward arrow here. That's because we're telling you that none of these products reforms into HCl. If you have something like hydrofluoric acid, on the other hand, you're gonna notice that you have this back and forth here. That's because you're going to form some hydrogen ions and some fluoride ions, but you'll also be reforming HF as you go. Okay, so we can rethink this idea of strong electrolytes um, or electrolytes in general, and we can further divide it up because when we have a strong electrolyte, that's going to indicate a, any kind of material that dissolves completely or that dissociates completely into ion form. So things like ion compounds, that's going to 100% dissociate. Things like strong acids will 100% dissociate. Strong bases will 100% dissociate. Those solutions are going to conduct electricity very, very well. Okay. Um, another example of that is something like or not another example, but another type of electrolyte is a weak electrolyte. And that is material that's going to dissolve partially as molecules, partially as ions, all right? So that those are our weak acids and our weak bases, right? You'll have some ions forming, but not all of it will be in ion form. Another thing to keep in mind is that whenever you have a compound that has a polyatomic ion in it, um, that will dissolve in solution, but the polyatomic ion is going to stay together, okay? So over here, we see that we have it's acetic acid, which is a weak acid. Um, when you have the partial ionization happen, you have the hydrogen ion separate, and then you're left over here with the acetate ion, right? Notice that the acetate ion doesn't separate out, you know, the pieces of it don't separate from one another. Okay, that's a very important thing to keep in mind. So here are your three classes. You have something that's a non-electrolyte, if it's a molecular compound, okay? Because you're not going to have any ions that form in solution. So if you tried to conduct electricity through it, you see you would get no results here. Um, over here, we have a weak electrolyte, which is something like a weak acid, right? Now that's gonna partially ionize in solution. So you'll have some ions and then you'll have some molecular compounds still. 
So when you run an electric current through it, you get a little result there. Okay, you could do it. If we have something like an ionic compound or a strong acid or a strong base, which would be a strong electrolyte, that would completely ionize in solution and you would get a very good current running through your solution. Okay, so take a minute, answer this question for yourself. Which aqueous solution conducts electricity? Um, what you want to think about is which of these is either an ionic compound, a strong acid, or a strong base. So clearly it is that one, KBR. Okay. Um, another term we need to think about is dissociation. So I may have even said it a few times already. Uh, but what does that mean exactly? When I say dissociation, I'm talking about the actual separation of your anions and your cations when your ionic compounds dissolve, okay? So if you have something like this, sodium sulfide, when one molecule of, or one, I guess, formula unit of uh, sodium sulfide dissolves, you have two sodium ions and one sulfide ion, okay? When you have a polyatomic ion compound dissolving, that dissociates into the cation and the anion. So in this case, the cation is just sodium ions, but the anion is the sulfate ion itself. Okay, so just like before, the sulfate ion stays together. It doesn't separate into its component atoms. All right, the same thing happens when a strong acid dissolves in water. You'll notice here, H2SO4. It dissociates into two hydrogen ions and one sulfate ion. All right. Um, actually, let me go back to this one more, one slide one more time. Um, something else to consider when you're looking at this dissociation is number-wise, let's follow what's happening here. If I have one Na2S and I dissolve that, it will dissociate into two sodium ions, one sul sulfur ion, sulfide. Okay, so one of these is going to give me two of these and one of these. All right, so concentration wise, think about what happens here. If I have one mole of this and then I dissolve it, Right, what do I have? I have two moles of this, right? And I have one mole of this. So if I have one molar, right, one mole per liter sodium sulfide, that means I'm gonna have two moles per liter of sodium ions or two molar sodium ions. I'm gonna have one mole per liter of sulfide ions or one molar sulfide ion, okay? Because if you think about um, definition of molarity, it's moles divided by volume, but our volume isn't gonna change. If we put you know, one mole of sodium sulfide into one liter of solution, when that sodium sulfide separates, it's not going to increase the amount of water that's present, right? But when this separates, it's still going to separate into two moles of the sodium ion and one mole of the, sulf the sulfide ion. All right. So now if you're asked something like this, determine the molar concentration of each ion in the following solutions. You have to think about what's happening here. Okay. First of all, you have to know what these things are. All right, so we have sodium permanganate and we have nickel three sulfate. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do is take the name here and we wanna make an actual compound out of that. So sodium permanganate. Do you remember what permanganate is? Okay, so that's NAMNO4. Now, once you have your compound, 
the next thing you have to do is immediately see how it dissociates in water. So we know that Na is a plus one ion, and we know that permanganate is a minus one ion. All right, so M NaMnO4 is going to dissociate in a one to one ratio. So one mole of the sodium permanganate is going to give me one mole of sodium plus one mole of permanganate. Okay, that means that if I start with 0 0.750 moles per one liter, I'm going to have 0 0.750 moles per liter of sodium ions. I'm going to have 0 0.750 moles per liter of permanganate ions because my ratio does not change. Uh, when I have nickel three sulfate, that's a little bit different. Okay, so nickel three sulfate means, first of all, how do I find the formula of this? I know that it's nickel three plus, and I know that sulfate is SO4 two minus. So the formula for nickel three sulfate is gonna be Ni2 SO4 three. Okay, now in solution, what does that break up as? Two nickel ions and bring it around three sulfate ions. Okay, so I have one mole, the two mole, the three mole. That's my ratio here. And that ratio is the important part. So if I start out with 0 0.750 moles of nickel sulfate for every one liter of solution, once it dissolves, I'm gonna get two times 0 0.750 moles of nickel ions for every liter of solution. And I'm gonna get three times 0 0.750 moles of sulfate ions for every one liter of solution because of my ratio. Okay. So my final result here, I would have, oh, let me use a different color. It's like, oh, that's confusing. There's so much happening here. Um, so I'd have 0 0.750 molar nickel sulfate would give me one point five molar nickel ions, and it would give me. 2.25 molar sulfate ions. Okay, so you're actually going to look at that mole breakdown and multiply the concentration of your original ion by the molar coefficient. So our initial concentration was 0.75 molar. We know that two nickel ions are going to form for every one nickel sulfate. So we can take 0.75 molar and multiply it by two, and we get 1.5 molar nickel ions. We know that three moles of sulfate are going to form for every one mole of nickel sulfate, so we could take 0.75 molar and multiply it by three to get our concentration of sulfate ions. Okay, so I would like you guys to try this one out on your own. Start by actually writing down what the formula for each of these compounds is. Once you have the correct formula written down, draw your arrow and break them up into, you know, their, just break them up into their, into their ions in solution. Okay, and include the molar coefficients. That's the most important part of this.
Okay, so let's try this out. That's ammonium. That's phosphate. So if these were going to form a compound, we would need three ammoniums for every one phosphate. When that's associated in solution, we would end up with three ammonium ions and one phosphate. So if I have 0.147 molar ammonium phosphate, I would have three times 0.147 molar ammonium ions. And I would have one times 0.147 molar phosphate ion. Okay, 0.147 times three is 0.441. Okay, so these would be my three molarities. Um, so the only one that would change there would be my ammonium. For barium hydroxide, that's Ba2 plus and OH minus one. So my formula is BaOH2. When that dissolves in solution, it's Ba2 plus and two OH minus. So by 0.147 molar barium hydroxide, I'm gonna have, I'll throw one in front of there just so we can keep this same trend going. One times 0.147 molar barium ions, and I'll have two times 0.147 molar hydroxide ions. So 0.147 times two, that's 0.294 molar hydroxide ion. So my concentrations of everything are there. Okay. Now we've only talked about ionic compounds so far that have that do dissolve in water, right? But not every ionic compound does dissolve in water, unfortunately, because why would that be true? Um, when we have a compound that does dissolve in water, we call that compound a soluble compound. When we have a compound that does not dissolve in water, we call it an insoluble compound. Okay, so an insoluble compound is an ionic compound that stays solid when you put it in water. All right, so there's two examples here of silver compounds. They're both ionic compounds, but one of them is a soluble compound and one of them is not. So if you put silver nitrate into water, all of it will separate into the ions. Okay, they'll all separate out into silver ions and nitrate ions. On the other hand, when you put silver chloride into water, the silver chloride is going to stay solid. Okay, two different things. Um, unfortunately, there's no real trend to whether um, particular ionic compounds are going to dissolve or not. Like you can't follow a trend on the periodic table or anything like that, uh, which you normally can. Um, and the best way to figure out if something is going to dissolve or not dissolve is to test it out. Okay, so a lot of other people have done this. And these are the results. Right, so you have to be comfortable with these results. So you need to know them. All right. You have to memorize the next two tables so that you can tell whether an ionic compound will be soluble in solution or whether it's going to stay solid. Okay. Um, so we broke down, I broke down these next two tables um, into this version one where you have all these compounds are usually soluble except in these particular situations. Okay, and the second table has these four compounds which are usually insoluble except in these situations. All right, so let's just talk through some of these real fast. Um, the first five ions on this list are very friendly ones, right? Lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium, nitrate, and acetate. One, two, three, four, five, six of them. 
six ions and they are always soluble. If you ever see any of those six ions attached to a counter ion, they will always dissolve in solution. Okay, no exception for those. The next four of them, they have a few exceptions attached. Okay, so chloride, bromide, and iodide, those are your halogens. They will be soluble, except when they're paired up with these three ions. Okay. Hey guys, I know that my screen just changed, but that is because I saw a typo and I wanted to fix it. <laughs> um, so focus in right over here at this mercury. Um, it said HG42+, but the actual correct ion is HG22+, okay? Um, that's the ion you're looking at as your exception there. Uh, continuing on with the sulfate ion, that is generally soluble, except when you're mixing it with lead or silver, um, or these three group two metals, strontium, barium, and calcium, okay? Other than that, sulfate is soluble. Onto the insoluble table, you have four main things to focus on here. The hydroxide ion, the sulfide ion, the carbonate ion, and the phosphate ion. Okay, these things are going to be insoluble most of the time, except when they're paired up with these group ones from that first table, right? You'll notice, remember we said that there are no exceptions to anything that combines with lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium. Um, that's true for hydroxide, for sulfide, for carbonate, and for phosphate. Okay, they're going to be soluble when they pair with those four things. Um, for carbonate and for phosphate, there are no other exceptions. Okay, it's just when they're paired with the uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium, they're going to be soluble. Everything else will be insoluble. For sulfide and hydroxide, um, we have to add in the condition that when we pair them with calcium, strontium, and barium, the sulfide compounds will be soluble. And calcium, strontium, and barium compounds will be slightly soluble with the hydroxide ions. Okay? Um, those are your only exceptions uh, for your insoluble material. Why does this matter? Well, I, oh, here, answer this question first. The presence of one of the following ions within a compound indicates that a compound is soluble with no exceptions. Uh, which ion is that? Hopefully in this case, you know that it's a nitride ion. Um, we have to look at this because we have to figure out whether products that we're seeing in the reactions that are happening, whether they're solid products or not, okay? Um, that's going to determine our results, right? When we're mixing two things together. So we have to be able to look at a compound and know right away whether it's going to be a solid compound or not. Um, so this is this is step one to that. Okay, so I want you to take a second, um, pull out the chart, pause this for a minute, and try these out on your own. Okay, and talk yourself through each one. So we're starting out with lead chloride. Okay, and we think back to that chart. Lead is one of our exceptions for chloride ions. Um, chloride is generally soluble except when it's paired with lead, silver, or mercury. So lead chloride would be insoluble. 
Copper chloride, on the other hand, is soluble because copper is not one of the exceptions listed. So our copper chloride ionic compound will be soluble. Calcium nitrate is soluble because nitrates are always soluble. Barium sulfate, well, is that one of our exceptions? You look over at your table, when sulfate pairs with strontium, barium, lead, silver, or calcium, the resulting compound is insoluble. Okay. And again, take a minute, take a pause, try these on your own. I'm going to put up the answers now. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay. We call reactions where we have a solid product at the end, precipitation reactions, okay? So precipitation reactions are gonna be where we start out with two aqueous solutions of ionic compounds. And when we mix them together, we are going to form an insoluble product or a solid. That insoluble product is also called a precipitate. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> here's an example of this. We have aqueous potassium iodide and aqueous lead nitrate. When we mix them together, we form potassium nitrate and we form lead iodide. Lead iodide is an insoluble product, so it forms a solid. And this is what that would look like if it were happening in real time. Okay, you form, you'd start to form this yellow solid precipitate. Now, if you mix two aqueous ionic solutions together and you do not see anything happening, we consider this um, to be no reaction occurring. All right, and an example of this would it be if you had something like potassium iodide and sodium chloride. When you mix these two things together, everything is gonna remain as ions in solution. Everything is still soluble. When everything is still soluble, that means no reaction is occurring. So there are steps to figuring out um, what's happening in a reaction, deciding whether or not uh, precipitation occurs. So let's talk through the steps um, and then we'll look at some examples, all right? The first step here is to determine what ions each aqueous reactant has. Okay, so you're gonna have to look at the different ionic compounds that you're mixing together, and then you're gonna break them up into their ion form. Then what you're going to do is you're going to determine the formula of the possible products. And we do that by something that's called ion exchange. So the cation from one reactant will pair up with the anion from the second reactant and vice versa. Then we'll need to balance out the charges of our different combined ions so that we can get the formula of each product. Once we have the formula of each product, then we're going to use the solubility rules and we're gonna decide if the products that we are looking at are soluble products or insoluble products. Okay, if you have, a, if you have both products um, turned out to be soluble products, you end up writing no reaction on the product side of the arrow. If you do have an insoluble product, you'll write the product down and then note in parentheses an S to indicate that it's a solid. Okay. Any soluble products will have an aqueous next to them while you're trying to figure things out because or an AQ next to it because that, that notes that they're aqueous and that they're staying as ions in solution. And you have to remember to balance out your equation when you're done, okay? I know that that's a lot of words and you're like, I don't, whatever, Lauren. <laughs> so let's look at some examples, okay? We're gonna look at, again, we're gonna look at this, uh, this Ki and this TBNO3. Um, and we go through some of the steps here, okay? And then I'll do the rest of them on the whiteboard.
Um, but we start, right, by saying, well, I've got Ki and I've got lead nitrate, right? My step one here is to break these things up into their ion components. So Ki breaks up into K plus and I minus lead nitrate breaks up into Pb2 plus and NO3 minus. All right, now when I want to do my ion exchange, my cation from one, from one of my compounds, it's going to pair up with the anion of my other compound. And the product that it would form would be KNO3. For my second set, I'm going to have the cation from my second reactant pair up with the anion from my first reactant. And the product that that would form would be PBI2. Okay, now once you have your two potential products listed here, now this is when you would go to your solubility table and you'd say, all right, let me look and see, is this soluble or insoluble? I mean, for now you can go to your solubility table, but by the time you take your next exam, you have to have it memorized, okay? But we would see that potassium nitrate is definitely soluble, so that will stay aqueous. PBI2, on the other hand, is insoluble, so that will be solid, all right? And this is when our next set of steps kicks in. All right, now I'm gonna bring this over to the whiteboard so that we can do that part out together. Okay, so this is the rewritten version of what we were just looking at on the screen. Um, so now we wanna write out our actual precipitation reaction. And our precipitation reaction is going to indicate what is solid and what is aqueous in the end. Okay, so we are going to rewrite, not a good K, we're going to rewrite our reactants. So we have Ki aqueous plus Pb NO32 aqueous. And our starting material is always aqueous, right? Because if it wasn't in solution, how could it mix together? And what it's going to form is PBI2 solid. We know that from our solubility table. And it's going to form KNO3. Uh, let's put an aqueous a little bit down there. Okay. Um, and we know that KNO3 is aqueous from our solubility table as well. Okay, so now we want to go back and we want to balance this equation. Okay, because your final equation has to be a balanced one. So you're going to go back and note the places where you have an imbalance. For example, I have two nitrates over here and I only have one nitrate over here. So I'm going to put a two in front of there. All right. Um, I have two potassiums over here now and I only have one over here. So I'll put a two in front of that. Now I have two iodines and two iodines. I have one lead and I have one lead. Very balanced. Um, in general, balancing your precipitation reactions is a very short process. It's not as complicated as the balancing that we were doing before. Uh, you know, it's usually changing just a coefficient or two. But do remember that you're only changing the coefficients. You're never changing the subgroups here. Okay, but this would be your complete precipitation reaction. Right, here is your next example. Write an equation for the precipitation reaction that occurs, if any, when solutions of potassium carbonate and nickel two chloride are mixed. So you probably should pause this right now before I put up the answer and try it on your own. Okay. The first thing you're going to try to do is write out the formula for potassium carbonate and for nickel chloride. Then you're going to break them down into their ion forms. You're going to do your ion swap to figure out what the potential products are. Then you're going to see if those products are soluble or insoluble. Once you do that, you should be able to write out the formula for it. So there's two formulas here. This would be maybe the first formula that you write down if you were not balancing as you went. You'll notice that you have two products. One is KCL, one is nickel carbonate. Um, you have to go back and you have to rebalance that equation when you're done. We can do this in this case by 
putting a coefficient of two in front of the KCL. Uh, and then it looks like everything balances out. Okay, but note here that you have an aqueous next to the KCL and you have a solid next to the nickel carbonate because this was your insoluble product. All right, next example, same thing. Pause this, try this on your own. Don't just wait for me to talk you through it. Have to be able to do it on your own. Um, now we're mixing ammonium chloride and iron three nitrate. So we wanna write down those formulas first, break them up into their ions, swap the ions and see what potential products form, and then decide if those products are soluble or insoluble. Once you do that, you rewrite the equation. And your two products in this case are ammonium nitrate, <clears throat> which is soluble and remains aqueous. Your second product is the iron chloride, which also remains aqueous. So in this case, your final reaction is NH4Cl plus FeNO3-3 yields no reaction because both products are aqueous and soluble. Okay, pause, try it on your own. Again, we have a situation where we have two products that are both aqueous. That leaves us with a no reaction. We have sodium hydroxide and copper two bromide now. I'm just gonna keep on telling you to pause it. Hopefully you're doing that on your own at this point and trying it. Let's see what we got here. We end up with sodium bromide, which is aqueous, and we end up with copper hydroxide, which is insoluble. So it's, it gets a solid symbol next to it. Um, our balanced precipitation reaction here is two sodium hydroxides plus one CuBr2 yields two sodium bromides aqueous plus one copper hydroxide solid. Okay, so those are precipitation reactions. Um, and we have been writing out these, the last four precipitation reactions that we looked at, four or five of them. Um, we have been writing them out in full molecular form. So what we've been doing is writing out molecular equations for these things, okay? That's not the only way to represent aqueous reactions, and we have to know each of the ways to do this. Um, <clears throat> molecular equations are the most common, and those involve the full chemical formulas of each component, okay? Uh, so we call them neutral formulas, the full formulas, because there are no ions involved in molecular equations. Um, you see everything in its full, chemical form. But the thing about molecular equations is that they are not representing what actually happens in solution because anything that's represented here as aqueous will not stay together in solution. If it's aqueous, that means that in solution, this would have already broken up into ion form. Okay, so we want to look at a more correct way or a more complete way to look at the the solution and what's happening in the solution. <clears throat> to do this, we are going to use complete ionic equations. Okay? Complete ionic equations are going to list all possible ions that are present in the solution, all possible reactant ions, all possible product ions. Anything that is noted as an aqueous solution <clears throat> excuse me um, in your formula will be broken up into its ion components so if you look back at our last example everywhere in this example where you see this aq that represents a compound that can be broken up into its ionic pieces and it would be broken up into its ionic pieces in a complete ionic equation, okay? So things like soluble salts or soluble ionic compounds, things like strong acids and strong bases, those things are written as ions, okay? Uh, 
insoluble substances or weak electrolytes or non-electrolytes, those are written in molecular form. Okay, so anything that dissolves 100% or ionizes 100% is written out in its ionic form. Anything that does not ionize 100% is written out in its molecular form. Uh, anything that has a solid, liquid, or gas notation is not dissolved, so it stays in its molecule form. Only things that have an AQ designation next to it are going to be separated into the, its component ions. So let's run through some of these rules. So we have this in blue here, we have a molecular equation, okay? So everything is in its neutral form. To break this up into my ionic equation, I'm going to take each component and I'm going to separate it into its ions. So I have two KOH molecules here. If I broke that up into its ion form, I would have two potassium ions and I would have two hydroxide ions. If I took my magnesium nitrate and I broke it up into its ion forms, I would have one magnesium ion and I would have two nitrate ions. Notice here that the coefficient applies to both components. The subscript only applies to the component that it is attached to. Okay. On my product side, I have two potassium nitrates. That means that I have two potassium ions and two nitrate ions. I have one MgOH2 solid. That means that I do not break this up in my product side of my complete ionic equation. I leave it alone. All right, so the, <clears throat> the complete ionic equation looks like this. Okay, now you'll notice that I've changed the color of some of those ions. Ions that appear on both sides of the reaction, meaning that they are present in the reactant side and the product side, and they don't change at all, those are called spectator ions, okay? They're called spectr spectator ions because they do not participate in the reaction. They're pretty much just watching it happen. So my potassium ion over here, it is in the same exact form as my potassium ion on the product side. My nitrate on the reactant side is in the same form as my nitrate on the product side. The same thing is not true for my magnesium. My, my magnesium is an ion form on the reactant side, and now it's part of the solid, so it did something. My hydroxide ion also did something. It formed a solid. So my magnesium and my hydroxide were not spectators. They were participants. My potassium and my nitrate those were spectator ions. And the next version of equation that we're going to look at is called a net ionic equation. And a net ionic equation looks very similar to the complete ionic equation, except we remove the spectator ions from it. Okay? So a net ionic equation will only have participants. It does not have spectators. So my net ionic equation of the same reaction would be my two hydroxide ions plus my magnesium ion forming magnesium hydroxide solid. Okay? So write the ionic and the net ionic equation for each of the following. Take a minute to do that. Your ionic equation, equation indicates a complete ionic equation. So the first thing you want to do is break up everything that is aqueous into its component ions. Then for the net ionic equation, you want to remove the spectator ions from that. Okay. So try that on your own. Okay. And then this is what that looks like. My K2SO4 breaks up into two potassium ions and one sulfate ion. A my silver nitrate breaks up into two silver ions and two nitrate ions. Potassium nitrate breaks up into two potassium ions and two nitrate ions. And my silver sulfate is a solid, 
so it's going to stay whole. Now that is my complete ionic equation. For my net ionic equation, I want to remove my spectator ions. So hopefully it's clear from here what the spectator ions are. That would be potassium and nitrate. So my complete ionic equation looks like this. Two silver ions and one sulfate ion, which is going to give me a silver sulfate solid. All right? Let's try this next one. Remember that anything that has a gas or a liquid notation next to it does not break up into its ion form, only things that are aqueous. Okay, so the first step here is going to be breaking up everything that is aqueous. Once I break up everything that's aqueous, I'm going to look for the ions that don't change. 2Na plus aqueous, 2Na plus aqueous doesn't change. 2Cl minus aqueous, 2Cl minus aqueous doesn't change. Things that do not change are spectators, and I'm going to remove them to write out my net ionic equation. Okay. So this is again a summary. Your molecular equation is going to show the complete neutral formula for every compound in a reaction. A complete ionic equation is going to show everything that is aqueous in ion form. That's going to include all of your strong electrolytes. A net ionic equation is going to remove your spectator ions and it's only going to show the species that actually change in a reaction. All right, so let's look at this example. Which of the ions listed below is a spectator ion in the complete ionic equation that's shown here? So you're going to look at both the left side and the right side. You'll notice that nitrate and sodium ion are present on both sides unchanged. That means that those are your spectator ions. So choice B is your answer here. Okay. Um, all right, now we're going to move on to talking about a few other types of reactions. So now we're going to look at two different types of reactions, uh, acid-base reactions and gas evolution reactions. Okay, acid-base reactions in particular are also called neutralization reactions. And we'll look at that in a little more detail in a couple of slides. But basically an acid and a base are going to come together and they're going to neutralize one another to form water. Okay, and that's, that's the standard reaction for a strong acid and a strong base. Uh, in some cases, when we have weak acids and weak bases, one of the products might be a weak electrolyte. Okay, for a gas evolution reaction, which many times is also an acid-base reaction, we end up having a gas form. Okay, and we would actually see that as physical bubbling in our product, all right? We're gonna look closer at the acid-base reactions and we have to start with some definitions. Um, we're going to look at just now the Arrhenius definition of acids and bases, right? There are a few other definitions of acids and bases and we'll get to them in later chapters. But right now we need to know the Arrhenius definition. So we're going to define an acid as anything that produces H plus ions. So for example, HCl, when it dissociates, produces H plus and Cl minus. So HCl is clearly an Arrhenius acid. An Arrhenius base is any substance that produces OH minus ions in an aqueous solution. So something like NaOH, when it dissociates in water, uh, forms Na plus ions and OH minus ions. So clearly an Arrhenius base. Okay. Sometimes we have a different number of hydrogen ions that are ionized from our acids. So I'm going to switch over to my whiteboard real quick to give you a couple of examples. So one example is H2SO4. Um, another example is, let's say, H3PO4. Okay, 
in solution for H2SO4, we have two hydrogen ions and we have one sulfate ion. Oh, that's two. Okay, so the fact that there are two hydrogen ions that are produced when this dissociates makes sulfuric acid a diprotic acid because there are two protons that are released into solution. Something like H3PO4, now this is a weak acid. So we know that it's not going to be 100% ionization. But we do see here that we have three hydrogen ions and one phosphate. Okay. This is a triprotic acid. Because there are three protons that are released. Um, these are both examples of what are called polyprotic acids. And polyprotic acids means there are going to be more than one proton released when the acid dissociates in water. Things that we have to keep in mind when we are looking at polyprotic acids is that when you have more than one hydrogen ion that is being released, that release is going to happen in order. Okay, that's what sequentially means. It means one after the other. And the first hydrogen that ionizes is always going to be the strongest ionization. So it's going to be closest to 100%. Okay. Now this is a, a bit better look at why they're called neutralization reactions. Okay, so here we have nitric acid reacting with calcium hydroxide, and it forms this soluble salt and water, okay? We call a solution, a neutral solution, if the pH is around seven, if it has no strong preference towards being acidic or basic. And this happens when an acid-base reaction occurs because any hydrogen ions that are present from the acid are going to react with the hydroxide ions that are created from the base and they are going to form water, which is neutral. All right, and this is going to be true as long as the salt that forms is a soluble salt. Okay, this is the only product, this net ionic equation here that's represented, that's the only type of net ionic equation that can occur when you have a strong acid reacting with a strong base right, because you have your calcium nitrate up here that will basically be spectator ions in this reaction. It'll just stay dissolved in, in the water. Uh, another term that you might see or that you, another notation that you might see is this hydronium ion here. Uh, that's H3O plus. That is just another way to indicate the H from the acid molecule um, that's being released into solution. All right, and you'll find the H and the H3O plus used interchangeably. Now to see where this comes from, this comes from, comes, I don't know. My wording is weird sometimes. To see where this comes from, you're going to look at what happens to this hydrogen ion when it reacts with this water, okay? Normally when we talk about the dissociation of hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, we just write the two separate ions, right? Um, in reality, what happens is that these two things separate from one another and this hydrogen attaches itself to this oxygen and it forms an H3O plus, which looks a little bit like this. And it has a little plus sign with it because it has an extra proton now. Uh, and then obviously we have the Cl minus that's still hanging out there. 
okay? Um, in both cases, the acid portion is represented by one of these two notations. Okay, and you can use either one. That's called the hydronium ion, and that's the hydrogen ion of the proton. One thing you'll notice about the last reaction is that we were using water, okay? That acid was reacting with water to form the hydronium ion. And we have to take a minute here to look at water and notice one of its more um, special properties, which is that it is something that is called either, let me write down the words over here. Um, it's called amphiprotic or amphoteric. I've seen it both ways. Okay, and what that means is that water is able to actually behave as an acid or a base depending on the situation that it's in. So it can form hydro hydronium ions, which are essentially H plus ions, or it can form hydroxide ions. So if you have water and you're adding like an acid to it, you're going to get H3O plus plus Cl minus, right? You looked at that already. Um, and what that looks like is that one of the hydrogen, well, the hydrogen ion that's attached to the strong acid is going to come here and form a bond with this pair of electrons, okay? So you end up with your, you got a little, We'll bracket it off real nice. Okay. Um, but what if you have a base? Okay, over here. Um, one base that's common, and we'll probably see a slide with this base in it shortly, is something like ammonia. Okay, ammonia is not a typical base because, or it's not a visually. Uh, easy to identify base because there's no hydroxide ion that's attached to the ammonia specifically. But what happens when you have ammonia reacting with water is that one of these hydrogen ions from water is going to actually attach itself to the ammonia. Okay, and what that gives you is an NH4 plus ion and then the remainder, the remainder from the water, which is an OH minus ion. So your water molecule goes from looking like this to looking like this. So the fact that water can behave as an acid or a base um, makes it amphiprotic or amphoteric. Okay, so again, that this is what the word amphoteric means that is something that can act as an acid or a base. Um, and here is another visualization of what we just looked at. It's a base like ammonia um, that actually produces hydroxide ions in water without initially containing a hydroxide ion in its own chemical formula. So it produces hydroxide ions um, by reacting with the water. So the NH3 pulls one of the hydrogen ions off of the water and it leaves behind a hydroxide ion. So this is a representation of our three different types of equations that we were looking at earlier in terms of acid-base reactions. Okay, and this is in particular strong acid and strong base reacting, right? HCl is a strong acid and AOH is a strong base that produces H2O and NaCl aqueous. Okay, so now if we were going to put that in terms of an ionic equation, everything that's aqueous, we can break up into its ion form. H plus plus Cl minus plus Na plus plus OH minus. We have our product here, which is liquid water. We can't break that up because it's not aqueous. And we have this aqueous salt, so we have Na plus and Cl minus. Our net ionic equation comes from removing the spectator ions from that ionic equation, and we are left with H plus 
plus OH minus gives us liquid water. Okay, so again, that is the net ionic equation for any strong acid, strong base reaction. Okay, because no matter which one you start with, that's going to be your net ionic equation for any strong acid and strong base reaction. This is the table of your six strong acids and six strong bases. You have to know these, okay? So you have to memorize their names and their formulas. There's only six of each, all right? But uh, it's important to remember them because you have to know exactly what dissociates 100% in solution, okay? So I'm gonna give you a minute to practice this. I hope it was a very quick minute for you. This is a strong acid. This is a strong base. So its net ionic equation is going to be H plus plus OH minus gives you H2O liquid. Okay. Um, if that wasn't clear to you just by looking at it, it is worth going through the process of breaking up the ions and canceling out the spectators so that you can see this yourself. Okay, you can do the same thing for sulfuric acid and lithium hydroxide. This is a strong acid, this is a strong base. The ionic equation will be H plus plus OH minus yields H2O liquid. All right, and now we're going to talk about a specific type of technique that we use um, that kind of plays on the interaction between acids and bases so that we can find information out about the concentrations of unknowns that we have. So a titration is a technique that we use to determine an unknown concentration of one solution from the known concentration of a different solution. Okay, now we're going to go through some terminology first and then I will show you an example. The titrant which is the solution that we're going to have inside of our glassware that we call a burette. Okay, a burette looks like um, a very long graduated cylinder and it has an opening on the end of it that you can dispense liquid from. So we're going to add our titrant to a burette. Then from the burette, we're going to mix our titrant with our analyte, which would be our unknown solution. So we're mixing our known solution and our unknown solution together. Okay, now we're going to do this because we're assuming that the two things are reacting as we mix them together. And we want to know the point where the moles of our titrant, the thing that we know the concentration of, is equal to the moles of our analyte, which is our unknown. At the point where those two mole values are equal, that's the equivalence point. Okay, now the equivalence point is not something that we can visualize because we still have a solution. So what we do is we add a chemical called an indicator to our reaction and the indicator will change color at a particular pH value. So in an acid-base titration, I might use an indicator like phenolphthalein, and it is clear at pHs that, that are below eight or nine, probably. And as I add hydroxide ion to it, or as I add base to the acid, my pH is going to slowly increase because things that are acidic have very low pHs and things that are basic have very high pHs. So as I add the base to my acid, my pH is going to increase. As soon as the pH gets high enough where the pH reaches around seven or eight, I'm going to start to notice a color change. My indicator won't be clear anymore. It's going to turn a pinkish color in the case of phenolphthalein. I know that when I see that pink color, that my pH is around seven, which means that the moles of my hydrogen ion 
are now equivalent to the moles of my hydroxide ion because that only happens at a pH of seven. Okay, so this is the process that's happening here chemically. You have a flask where your acid is. Okay, and I'm gonna have my phenolphthalein inside of this flask as well. And the pH is going to be well below seven here, right? Maybe the pH is zero, one, something like that. And I'm gonna be adding hydroxide ion from my burette. Okay, so now as I add hydroxide ion here, my hydrogen ions are, see, they're gonna to start to react with the hydroxide ions and they're gonna form water, right? That's called neutralization. That's why these reactions are called neutralization reactions. Um, as, as these two components form the water, my pH starts increasing. And as soon as my hydrogen ions equal my hydroxide ions, and I only have these neutral water molecules present, at that pH, my indicator is gonna turn pink and I'll be able to actually see the endpoint. Okay, so this is another visualization. And I just wanna show you guys what this looks like. So we'll just watch this real quick, only for a minute or so. Okay, but you have, in this case, you have this, titrant up here. This is a different reaction. Um, but as you add the titrant, the solution stays clear until you hit the equivalence point. You notice? See, we started and it was clear and you could add the titrant to it and it keeps on clearing up, clearing up. But the second that you hit the equivalence point, now your solution is going to stay this pink color. And now you know that the moles of the titrant are equal to the moles of the analyte. So let's do some calculations with titrations. Um, this example here, you're titrating a 25 milliliter HCl sample of unknown molarity. So we don't know the molarity of this hydrochloric acid. We do know that it takes 25.4 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide to reach the equivalence point. What is the concentration of the HCl solution? Okay, so we have to think about the things that we know here. We know that at the equivalence point, the moles of our hydrogen ions are going to equal the moles of our hydroxide ions. We know that we can use the molarity of the sodium hydroxide and the volume of the sodium hydroxide to calculate the moles of sodium hydroxide. We know that we have the volume of the HCl. Okay, so now you have to try to fit this all together like a puzzle. Try that out for yourself for a minute. Hit the pause button if you have to. And now I want you to take a look at the steps. So we know the definition again of molarity is moles divided by liters and we know the volume of the HCl, 0 .2, 0 0.0250 liters, right? That's 25 milliliters converted into liters. Now we need to find the moles of HCl. The first step in doing this is gonna be writing out a balanced equation between the acid and the base that we're working with, okay? And I'll show you why this is important in the next step. Now we see here that one mole of hydrochloric acid and one mole of sodium hydroxide are gonna produce one mole of water. So there's a one to one mole ratio between HCl and NaOH. That means that at equivalence, when our moles of H plus equal our moles of OH minus, our moles of HCl are going to equal our moles of NaOH because these exist in a one to one ratio as well. So then we can find our mole value. So moles of NaOH is going to be the molarity, which is 0.1 molar, times the volume in liters, which is 0 0.0254 liters. So we have 0 0.00254 moles of NaOH. That means that we have 0 
four moles of HCl. To find the molarity of HCl, we're going to take this mole value and divide it by the volume in liters. And this is the molarity of our unknown hydrochloric acid. Okay, so it's just a step-by-step -step process. Okay, try this one on your own. Again, the first thing you want to do is write out the balanced equation. Note that there's a one-to-one -one ratio between the acid and the base. So when we find the moles of NaOH that are present, we will also know the moles of the HCl. Next step is finding this. So molarity times the volume, 0 0.100 times 0 0.01254. That will give us the moles, well, it'll give us the moles of NaOH. The moles of NaOH are equal to the moles of HCl here. Once we take that mole value and divide it by the volume, that will give us the molarity of the HCl. It's a very straightforward process when we have a monoprotic acid and a base that only has one hydroxide ion that contributes. Okay, but that's not always going to be the case. So take a minute and try to set up this example for yourself and then we'll look at it on the whiteboard. Okay, so this is the question. Um, step one, per usual, I need to write out the balanced equation that's happening between my acid and my base. So I have H2 SO4 plus KOH. I know that my H and my OH are going to react. That's going to form water. and my potassium and my sulfate are gonna react and that's gonna form potassium sulfate. Um, if this process, if writing out these, these formulas is still confusing to you, it might be a good idea to go back to Mastering Chemistry and to try some of the dynamic study modules about writing out compounds from ions, okay? So we're going to balance this out real quick. Okay, I've got um, one, two, three of those. I've got two Ks. I'm going to just put a little two in front over here. Now I have four hydrogens. So I'm going to put a two in front of there. So I have four. I've got four, five, six oxygens. Four, five, six oxygens. Two. Okay. Yeah, I think everything else looks good now. So this is balanced out. Now the reason you do this now is to write out this ratio, because what do we have here? One mole of H2SO4 equals two moles of KOH. And that's different from anything that we've looked at before. Okay, we were able to make an equivalence directly from our mole calculation in the last example, and we cannot do that here. We're still going to find moles of KOH the same way as we did before. We're going to take the molarity, which is 0 0.158 molar. We're going to multiply it by the volume in liters. And we are going to get a mole value, 0.158. Times 0 0.02287. Okay, so that is our mole value for KOH. Now we have to see well, how many moles of H2, oh, H2SO4 is that equivalent to? All right, so I'm going to bring this mole value over to my next line. And now I'm going to use my balanced equation. I'm going to say, well, for every two moles of KOH, 
that's going to be every two moles of KOH is going to require Okay. Okay, so we see why that where that ratio comes in handy now we see that there's a two to one ratio here. Okay, so for every 0.00361 moles of KOH, we're gonna require 0 0.00181 moles of H2SO4. Now that we know the mole value for H2SO4, now we can calculate its molarity. Okay, so molarity of H2SO4 is going to be 0 0.00181 moles divided by the volume, which is 20 milliliters, but we're going to convert it into liters. And we get a molarity of 0 0.0903. Okay, so very important to do this first step here. Do not forget to write a balanced equation for yourself before you start this process. After you start, step one is to figure out the moles of whichever component you're given the molarity and the volume of. The next step is to equate the moles of one thing to the moles of the other thing. That's the step here. And for that step, we need our balanced chemical equation. Once we know the moles of our unknown, then we can divide it by the volume of our unknown and we can find the molarity. Uh, the last reaction type that we have to look at are called redox reactions. Um, and these are reactions where we're gonna be looking specifically at electrons that are transferred from one reactant to another, okay? Redox is the shorthand for them. Um, their oxidation and reduction reactions. I'm sure that you guys have heard of these before. Uh, a lot of common reactions that we look at are examples of redox reactions. So you're looking here at rusting or combustion reactions. Those are all examples of redox reactions. They involve electron transfer that we don't actually see when we write out the equations in their longhand form, but it exists nonetheless. So let's look at what's happening here. We have sodium metal plus oxygen gives me two sodium oxides. Sodium metal plus chlorine gives me two sodium chlorides. These reactions are both involving a metal that reacts with a nonmetal. And in both of these, we are en we're ending up converting what is a free element here into an ion form that will subsequently make an ionic compound, okay? For redox reactions, we can also look at electron density, all right? All that means is that when you have a substance that may be held together by a covalent bond where we have sharing of electrons, um, you might have uneven sharing of electrons. Right, so we could tell from this chemical formula here that HCl is in its gas form. It's going to be held together by a covalent bond because we don't 